What do you get when you combine a former English merchant and his best friend, a trip to Mexico, and an intrepid spirit that leads two people to flee from their own guides and experience a cocktail bar of their own volition? Well, you get, uh, a, frankly, a kind of stolen cocktail from Mexico City in the 1930s. The Mexican Firing Squad on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, how the ho there, my name is Michael. I am a home mixologist and a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And today we are talking about another grenadine cocktail, much like last week's Bacardi cocktail in the form of the Mexican firing squad. Quick full disclosure, I've never had this cocktail before, so I'm gonna be trying it in front of you all for the first time. And this has nothing to do with that. This is rum from last episode that I felt like finishing. So gonna put that down. No, today we're talking about the Mexican firing squad, which is sort of a sour, a tequila sour variation, kind of leaning away from being a margarita, more like a tequila daiquiri. It's not really a really great way to classify it, especially considering that there's more than one way it can be made. Before we get into all that, let's take a step back and talk about where the drink comes from. Mexican Firing Squad is a principal cocktail on the menu of La Cucaracha, which back in the 1930s was a popular cocktail bar in Mexico City. Now this cocktail bar was visited by an author named Charles H. Baker, who was a former merchant uh, who ended up exploring the world to seek out new creative experiences, and in particular, cocktails. Now, he is the first person to actually put the Mexican firing squad into writing, and he does so in his 1939 book, uh, The Gentleman's Companion. Uh, but he himself experienced this two years prior in 1937, and the cocktail likely existed for a significant amount of time prior to that, you know, as long as the bar existed, most likely. The Cucaracha is actually worth mentioning, you know, on its own, because at the time, it was one of, like, the swinkiest, most hip cocktail bars in Mexico City. It had this nice big menu full of, like, robust and, like, proper classic cocktails that were made really, really well. I mean, this is a place that was actually worth, was worth visiting. Compared to the places that apparently the guides that Charles Baker you know, escaped from to go visit this bar uh, were taking him to. There's a note in in the book where Charles says, my companion and I were, were being escorted by these two caballeros from, from the area and we were served drinks that were too warm and places that were too boring. And we broke away and went to this bar and in their own words, were nearly wrecked upon many a Mexican firing squad. Which excites me because I like grenadine, I like lime, I don't mind tequila, not my favorite spirit, but I think it's pretty damn good. Uh, and honestly, there's Ango bitters in it too, so can't go wrong there. <laughs> now, I mentioned that even though Charles shares you know, his experience with this cocktail, and in his book, it is built like a more traditional sour, there are actually more than one way to make the cocktail. You can do the obvious, you know, upstyle or on the rock sour, like you would find a margarita being prepared as, but you could also find it served as sort of a lengthened Collins-style drink using some club soda, which is more of like a summer preparation of the cocktail or maybe a spring preparation of the cocktail than a summer style one. There's definitely a different sort of approach to how you prepare and garnish these two things. The sour is obviously more, you know, refined. It's about the drink itself. It's just got like a little wheel of lime, but the actual Collins version is it's got like an orange wedge and like cherries and stuff in there. It's a whole odd kind of split, a dichotomy, if you will, between two preparations of the same drink, um, which is fascinating. It doesn't happen very often. So today we're gonna make, very simply, the sour version of a Mexican firing squad. Now you know me, I love my specialty ingredients, and of course this cocktail does have one. In this case, it's gonna be some grenadine, which we've talked about before. It's a pomegranate syrup that uh, sort of replaces simple syrup as a way to add a sort of dark, rich, savory, red berry flavor to a lot of cocktails and enhance their sort of I guess complexity, but it's also introducing a complimentary flavor that traditionally goes along well with nearly any citrus and nearly any spirit. You're gonna need some of that for this cocktail and because it is the only sweetener in the cocktail, I would recommend you make it yourself. I will put my recipe for this in the description down below. It's just a simple, rich, uh, a, very, a very basic, simple, rich, simple syrup with pomegranate juice instead of water. That being said, that's about all we need to, to discuss. The cocktail's got a pretty basic history and even though we don't know who came up with it individually, we can honor them by making one ourselves. So let's make a Mexican firing squad. 
I'm gonna start this off with a sort of accentuating ingredient that does not appear in many other sours in this form, uh, some Angostura bitters. The original recipe calls for two dashes, but it seems that modern conceptualizations of this drink actually push more towards the Angostura bitters. I've seen as many as four dashes, as few as two. I think either of those options is going to be fine here. I like Ango, so I'm gonna do a pretty heavy pour of the Ango, four dashes. Next up, I'm gonna reach for our homemade grenadine. We're gonna to add to our shaker three quarters of an ounce of that grenadine. Next up, we'll need some freshly squeezed lime juice. I'm gonna come behind that grenadine with one ounce of that freshly squeezed lime juice. Finally, we need our tequila. Um, normally, I would recommend Camarena as a Blanco tequila that is worth using in a lot of mixed drinks. Uh, and even Charles Baker himself mentions that you should find a nice bottle of an unaged Blanco tequila to use in a Mexican firing squad because in his own words, there are a lot of raw distillations. I have one of those raw distillations today. <laughs> I'll be using Salsa Blanco Tequila. This is a perfectly serviceable Blanco Tequila, but it's not one that I think is particularly fancy. Um, going a step up to something around 35 bucks here is probably gonna be a good idea because we're gonna have to use two ounces of our Blanco Tequila. That's all our ingredients. Let's go ahead and grab some ice. As always, we are sticking firmly to our one cube hole and one cube cracked ethos. That was a clean break. That was cool as shit. I love it when that happens. We will cap that up, tap that down. And we're gonna go ahead and shake this for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. As I am to understand it, a Mexican firing squad is actually going to be served in a double old fashioned glass over the rocks. So we're gonna grab one of those. Gonna fill that nice and tall with plenty of smaller ice. Remember, the more ice, the better, because the more chilling you have, the less dilution you'll experience. So fill that glass as much as you can. <laughs> and we'll grab our strainer and double strainer cocktail over that ice. The garnish for a Mexican firing squad is pretty simple. We're just gonna go ahead and take some lime here and cut a wedge of that, and then place that along the rim like so. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Mexican firing squad. Alrighty, with our station more or less cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our Mexican firing squad a taste. Cheers. Oh, you gotta be fucking me. Oh, holy shit. That is fucking awesome. <laughs> the thing about grenadine is that it is typically pretty sweet. And I mean, I'm using a double simple kind of version of it here, so it is pretty potent. At three quarters of an ounce, we're doing plenty of sweetening here. What the bitters is doing is sort of combating that alongside the bright, harsh acidity of lime and saying, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna give this, this insane amount of just like balance to this, just so perfectly rested at the point where you find all of the flavors are existing in equal volume, but without any one of them tarnishing anything else. They are, they are in perfect harmony. And alongside this very rich, you know, warming baking spice and the kind of dark, robust, strong, dark, savory, dark, I don't know, I'm running out of adjectives. <laughs> this dark, savory, sweet berry flavor and that lime acidity brightening everything up. You're getting these really, really nice, very, very sharp tequila flavors, this very vegetal and sort of um, kind of prickly peppery kind of approach that is just so perfect. It's, it's, um, it's amazing actually. <laughs> it's, it's warm baking spice overtaking a very brief, you know, sort of window of this berry flavor. The lime comes in behind alongside the tequila and gives it this full experiential body and lets it be just very real tasting. And just, oh, wow, I don't have words to describe this. It's reminding me of a lot of a margarita, but one that I think is more effectively using the ingredients therein is a sort of more pronounced, less harsh, more 
nuanced balance to this that allows all these flavors to kind of ebb and flow together. Nothing is too loud, it's not too sour, it's not too sweet, it's not too bitter, it's not too agave. It's, it's really, really perfectly rounded. Um, and it's not a particularly complex or challenging flavor to have to approach, which, I mean, if you're looking for that, look somewhere else, but there's really nothing wrong with that either. So that is truly, truly amazing. Oh my God. That might be my favorite tequila cocktail. I'm not gonna lie. I, I'm not a huge fan of tequila. I find that the flavor of agave is not usually for me. When I drink tequila, I prefer uh, añejos, the rich sort of oaky character of aging makes it more approachable for me. But that has got to be the best combo of flavors that really allow the tequila to accentuate itself and be modified by that I've ever tasted. That, that, yeah, that tops the list. That tops the list for sure. <laughs> and that's coming from somebody who spent like a ridiculous amount of time perfecting a fucking cilantro julep I know what the fuck I'm talking about when I experience a good tequila cocktail. Jesus. Use a nicer tequila than I did. You know, get like a Camarena or um, a Fortaleza, something nice, something 100% agave and something sustainably sourced. Um, Cause you will, you will taste it and you want it to be good. That sounds is just good enough that I'm like, this is really, really good. But um, dude, fucking wow. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna have to have more than one of these. This is really, really great. Just gonna. Gonna do this real quick. Just give it a little bit of that. Just it up a little bit. Sláinte. <sighs> Re, fucking, refreshing. Holy shit. Well, that caps off the content of this video. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. We're going to go ahead and do a quick reading from our book, Crisp Toast, by William Evans and Andrew Frothingham. Two names that are exceptionally difficult to pronounce when you have just chugged a tequila sour. I have just enough left to toast with, so we're going to go ahead and read again from the adolescence section. And today's toast goes as such. Here's to our <laughs> sorry, this one's good. Here's to our adolescent friends. May their clothes never be as loud as their music. Jeez. That's one of those ones that reminds me that this book was written in like 93. Because loud ass clothes and bright colors, very 90s thing. Rather than the music be loud too, my guy. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed, go ahead and click the like button down below and hit subscribe to be notified whenever I make new episodes. I do that every Friday and then like today, some days on Tuesdays. So go ahead and click the bell, man. If you wanna know when I'm making stuff, click the bell. That's how it works. I have other socials that you can follow me on that are either appearing on the screen now or have been up for some time. Um, I don't really use them as much as I do YouTube. I'm really kind of just here and I'm trying. I want so badly to find the time to get back into doing TikToks, but if you were gonna follow me anywhere, do it on IG, do it on TikTok, and do it here. Those are the places that I live the most. There's nothing really left in here, but I guess I'll suck on the ice or something, as I say. Thanks for watching. You guys have a great rest of your day, and please remember to drink responsibly. I'll see you around.